Class discussion time. Me and the weasel. Hey, hey Coco. Let's talk about differential equations. So pretend it's like regular class because that's what it's going to be like. Nobody ever says anything. They never say nothing. Oh. All right, so suppose we have, it's just a regular old second order. It's going to be kind of nice over here because, um, you know, r squared minus 3, r minus 4 will factor. And this is not a scary forcing term because it doesn't resonate. It doesn't match. I don't have a hassle. So I can solve that using regular old homogeneous and particular solution. Or I can solve it using Laplace transforms. It's not exciting doing it with Laplace transforms because you already know what the answer is going to be doing it the other way. But would it be the same answer? So what do you think, Coco? Would it be the same answer? Would it be the same answer? And Coco says, yes, it would be the same answer because of uniqueness of solutions. Remember, if you have a differential equation and initial conditions, there's only one solution. So it might look slightly different, but it'll be logically equivalent. All right, next. What's the Laplace transform of 1? So uh, Coco says, oh, yeah, just use the table. Just use the table. Oh, yes. So we use the table, and the formula says Laplace transform of, of uh, t to the n. So this would be t to the 0, and that turns out to be 1 over s, because it's s to the n plus 1, and n would be 0. And this 1 comes from 0 factorial on the table, and 0 factorial is 1. Your calculator knows this, but to find the factorial, you got to use, uh, I think it's the math button, and one of the one of the menus will have just an exclamation mark, so you can get you can get factorial. You can get factorial. Hello. Anyway, so it's it's nice to know that Laplace transform of of one is one over s. Maybe write that on your table. I don't want to tell you what to do, but if you write it on your table, then it's always there for when you go to do a test. So what would be the Laplace transform of fifteen? And Coco Banana says, call on me, I am ever so smart. So she says, well, that's just 15 times 1. So this would be 15 times 1 over s, which would be 15 over s. So that's not so scary. Now, next question. Now, over here, we just did. We just did the Laplace transform of 1. Turned out to be 1 over s. How come... The Laplace transform of the heavy side function. How come the Laplace transform of the heavy side function is uh, e to the negative a s over s instead of just one over s? Because the heavy side function is zero and then it's one. That's all it is. So how come we got this extra complicated piece? So I asked this question to the class, and there's just dead silence. Let's give them a chance to think. What would be their answer? What would they say? And I might not say much. But somebody, if you were smart, you'd say, okay, what does Laplace transform do? It's an integral from 0 to infinity. Ah, so here we do the integral from 0 to infinity. But here we do the integral from a to infinity. And when you evaluate, that a goes in instead of a 0, so an extra piece survives. And that's why we have this, this thing with little a and it's surviving because it gets that little a gets put into the into uh, the uh, antiderivative. You evaluate it, and the little a survives. All right, next question. You should all be able to use the table on something simple. What's that one? Well, the only tricky part is you got to make sure you're looking at something with s in it. And on the table, the thing that has s on the top is cosine. And this has to be omega squared. Well, 1 squared is 1. So this is just cosine of t. So it's the inverse Laplace transform of that. Let's just use the table. And now, can you name one forcing term that the Laplace transform doesn't handles that the other stuff doesn't handle? And everybody, everybody should know this one. Everybody. Because it's on the board, this guy. That's the answer to the Heaviside function. And now we're going to see another thing that the Laplace transform handles that regular old methods wouldn't handle. All right, now. The next thing that Laplace transform can handle is the thing called the Dirac delta. So Dirac, French guy, long dead, uh, around at the time of development of the theory of quantum mechanics and, and uh, atomic bomb theory, very influential mathematician physicist, mostly physicist. And delta is just a Greek letter name. It's the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, the fourth letter of the Greek, Greek alphabet. It looks kind of like a squidgy D, and it gets a subscript of A. 
So get used to it. Don't don't be afraid to say it. You know, if it was in class, I'd make you all say Dirac Delta, Delta sub A. At least it's not Delta sub Alpha. But just, you know, be able to say these things. And here's how the Dirac Delta is defined. The Dirac Delta is the limit of this guy, G sub Delta of T. So Delta sub A is equal to the limit as Delta T approaches 0 of G sub Delta of t. So that's what the definition is. Now let's let's understand. Here's what Dirac delta does. First you need this g of t, g sub delta, this guy here. And it's equal to k as long as t is between 4 minus delta t and 4 plus delta t. This is right out of the book and the book uses a 4. I think that's really smart to use the 4 because if because the 4 can be whatever number you need it to be, but if they let that be another letter it would just be alphabet soup. You'd have letters everywhere. So the 4 in the book can be whatever number you want it to be. But they're going to drag this 4 along all the way through. And then they do problems without the 4. So uh, here's what Dirac Delta does. It's like a little explosion. It's like a pop. Because this area has to be 1. So the height can be k. k changes depending on the, the size of delta t. Delta t is two letters to name one number. It means change in t. So you have 4 plus delta t, and over here I didn't mark it, 4 minus delta t. So you're, you're a little bit away from 4 on each side, the same amount away from 4, and the area has to be 1. So for instance, if delta t is 1 tenth, then k has to be 5. If delta t is 0.02, k has to be 25, because k is equal to 1 over 2 delta t. And if you divide by something small, you get something big. So this little box gets taller and thinner, depending on how small delta t is. So that's what g of delta t is. It's a graph that actually is 0 all the way here. Then you get a little place where it's worth k, and then it's 0 the rest of its life. So it's not a heavy side function, but it's certainly discontinuous. I don't mean to draw it as if it's continuous. The box area has to be 1. But the vertical sides of the box are not part of the function. So that's g, of del g sub delta t. And then if you take the limit as delta t goes to 0, that's the Dirac delta. And what's weird is we don't take that limit. The physicists do funny stuff mathematically sometimes. In this case, this is that thing, and don't take this limit. Just call it limit as delta, approaches, delta t approaches 0 of g sub delta t. Just call it that whenever you need it. But you can also write delta sub a. What it stands for is a little punch, just a quick boop. That's what it stands for. So we're going to do the Laplace transform of just the g sub delta of t. The book does this out. This is right out of the book. I even use their 4. See how the 4 is parked here? So remember, it's supposed to be the integral from 0 to infinity. Well, we're going, we have a function that's 0 everywhere except for this tiny little neighborhood around 4. So those two markers on the t-axis, you know, those two little markers, that's where the integral is non-zero. So that's my integral, definition of the Laplace transform. Well, i got to do a chain rule adjustment because this thing's just a constant. This 1 over 2 times uh, delta t is just a constant. So I need to, to, I can drag that out front, but I need a negative s. So there's a negative s outside, down below, to cancel out the negative s up here. So now I can do this integral. I get the number out front e to the negative st, evaluated from here, and just put in the evaluation. So next up, we're going to do the Dirac delta because if you remember from calculus, calc 1, if you have the limit of something um, that you have well-defined, a lot of times you can do the something well-defined limit or the limit of the something well-defined, the two things are switchable. With class transform being a linear transformation, I can slip it inside and outside the limit. So I'm going to take the limit of the Laplace transform of g, and it actually stands for the Laplace transform of the limit of g. It stands for the same thing. So I'm finding the Laplace transform of the Dirac delta. So that's the very next thing. Check it out. Finishing up, we're taking the Laplace transform of the Dirac delta which is, write it like this, it's the Laplace transform of the limit as delta t approaches 0 of g sub delta, which by, since L is a linear transform, you can switch these two things. 
So the limit of the Laplace transform. So we're doing the Laplace transform of G sub delta of T. And that's where we left off. We're doing the Laplace transform. So we've gotten to the point where we did the transform. We did the integral. Now we're taking the limit of the integral. It's a very tricky one. This was down on the uh, bottom right of the screen. Now it's up here, and I, I uh, deal with the, um, the exponent that has two terms. So there's a, a pair of, of terms here. Just a second. One of these guys is not supposed to have a minus sign. There we go. So you've got a, a minus negative on one of them. So otherwise, they would all be the same. They'll cancel. So you've got an e to the negative 4s in common. So you can drag that out. So that's what we do is drag out that e to the negative 4s. We have the negative 1 over s still here from the adjustment for the uh, chain rule. And then I slip the 2 delta t from outside here back under here because delta t is going to 0. We're taking the limit as delta t goes to 0. Check it out. What rule do we have here? Well, delta t goes to 0, I get 1 minus 1 over 0. So we use L'Hopital's rule. And what's annoying is the book does this, but they don't say what, what happens from this step to this step. A lot of stuff happens, including L'Hopital's rule. So we're going to take the derivatives and take the limit. Sorry, I didn't take the limit yet. Didn't take the limit yet. But we take derivative of this, and the variable is delta t. That's pretty tricky stuff. So take these derivatives and the s's. The negative s comes down. The positive s comes down. And now I've got two negative s's right there. Delta t goes to 0. This delta t, I should be going because I took a derivative. Sorry. Took the derivative of that. That's just a 2. And uh, anyway, so I've got these two terms go to negative s, negative s. That's negative 2s. I have a 2, and I have an s, and I have a negative. Everything cancels. Everything cancels. And you just have e to the negative 4s. And that's the Laplace transform of the Dirac delta, where this was Dirac, Dirac delta delta sub 4 because of the 4. Then the 4 can be a 5. It can be a 7. So if this is a 7, that's e to the negative 7s. Pretty tricky stuff, huh? Isn't that cool? So the next video, the next video is the last one of this chapter. So you know what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to have one more video where we use uh, Dirac delta to model an explosion and then solve that differential equation. And when I send out that video, I'll be sending out a practice test. Yay! And we're moving on, kids. Now, I know, I know, it's it's Holy Week and there's Easter. Um, I don't want to interrupt your, uh, your, your three-day weekend, but um, I'm moving on and I'm sending you stuff to do because, well, it's, it's, it's good stuff. We're doing good things. All right, you guys, now look, stay safe, take care of yourselves, but also, you know, read the book and try problems.